Filtration and Avoiding Clogging, presented by Al Silstra from Dram Water Company. Filters are one of the most common greenhouse components, and like a lot of familiar things, their importance is often undervalued. Recently, we've learned a lot in our company about the effects of filtration on plant health. Seeing more than ever the importance of superior filtration in plant production, much of what we see is related, uh, is translated from the world of animal agriculture and vegetable production, where feed conversion ratio is closely monitored simply because they get paid by the pound. We're now seeing that it applies to floriculture production as well although uh, the valuation, the uh, payback, is a little bit more difficult to calculate. My objective today is to discuss practical field level experience for filtration requirements. Uh, this is not a presentation of research results. The subject of filtration technology for our industry is really huge. And in 30 or so minutes available today, I can really only scratch the surface of the subject so I've chosen to focus on just three key aspects. What I hope to accomplish today is simply to improve the awareness about what adequate filtration really looks like, or what inadequate filtration really looks like, what adequate filtration looks like, and the key considerations in the design and selection of superior filtration systems. In filter selection, we've traditionally started with the orifice size and perhaps the, um, the source of the water for our irrigation equipment, what I call component-centric design, fine particle removal for fog, drippers, misting, and so on, and coarser filtration for hand watering, sprinklers, flood floors, less demanding filtration requirements. Of course, the water source dictates the expected level of contaminants. Wells and municipal supplies usually present little concern about particulate. Ponds and streams can be expected to bring debris, algae, and a lot higher turbidity levels, so we, we increase our filtration, perhaps add a layer of filtration to systems like that. Of course, water source and the type of emitters must always be considered. But we're beginning to learn that these represent really only a primary level of filtration. A key point I want to make today is that if we rely mostly or only on water source in the emitter, we're probably missing the boat on the real value of filtration, which is that experience from the plant's perspective. Like anything in horticulture, the thing that we want to do is what results in the highest quality and volume of production with the lowest input cost. A lot of the negative impacts to production that we see in irrigation are partially the result of inadequate filtration. By my observation, actually, uh, probably above average amount come from inadequate, inadequate filtration. By themselves, each of these are small enough that we might not recognize them. But taken together, they can amount to a significant impact, such as production shrink, whether it's the result of delays from stress or delays from low dissolved oxygen levels or just dead plants from clogged emitters. They reduce our production. Excess labor costs for changing drippers, moving plants, etc. A grower recently told me that one full-time employee is dedicated in a single range just to finding and replacing clogged drippers. That's a pretty excessive cost in a relatively small range. Higher fertilizer use because root uptake efficiency is decreased by unnecessary biofouling of the, of the plant's root system or blinding of the plant's root system. Higher chemical use to deal with algae and other passion pathogens that we might be able to filter out. A higher rate of shrink at retail once we've shipped it to the store. Reduced quality so it doesn't sell quite as quickly. Uh, delayed loss from root disease, a pithy infestation that perhaps didn't show up until after we shipped it. 
and generally lower product quality, which lowers grade or value and uh, eventually lowers price, low, lower sell-through rates, and resulting in fewer turns. And of course, reduced customer satisfaction and sale repeatability when the customer gets it home and it doesn't last as like it should or doesn't look as well as it should. And I'm sure there are more. So what's the flip side of superior filtration and what does it look like? First, it's important to realize that superior filtration is always step number one in any water treatment process. Regardless of the treatment method, whether you use ozone, UV, chlorine dioxide, uh, dioxide hydrogen peroxide, uh, chlorine, heat pasteurization, whatever the case, you're going to pay anyway. You're going to pay for the filtration, either with efficient filtration or the higher costs of treatment to burn it up. Our experience is that you may as well do it right up front. Mechanical removal filtration is always one of the first and lowest cost steps in cleaning up your water, whether just to prevent clogging of your drippers or to deploy a complete disinfection and recycling systems. Superior filtration helps to improve water use efficiency. It reduces biofouling of the root systems, as I've mentioned, which improves water uptake. It also allows the best possible performance from irrigation distribution systems and irrigation emitters. There's also significant impact on plant health, resulting from the higher dissolved oxygen levels available to the plant and improved nutrient and water absorption by the root system. We've seen this particularly in fine filtration for flood floors, where thin water layers on sun or hot water heated concrete result in warmer water, and the higher than average levels of organic material from the floors can quickly lead to an anoxic water condition in the storage tank. In our experience, filtering that water down to below 15 microns does a substantial part of the work of keeping that tank water clean and increasing dissolved oxygen levels in that water, reducing the biofouling of the root systems. Fine filtration is the first stage of pathogen removal as well. Filtration alone at or about 10 microns can remove, although it's important to realize it doesn't eliminate it, but it removes many of the microorganisms that we fight with. And superior filtration can significantly reduce maintenance costs spent in replacing drippers, unclogging clogging valves, and so on, as we discussed before. The first step in identifying the requirements of filtration and the cause of clogging is to understand more about the water chemistry and what it is we're actually filtering, filtering out. That can be broken down into four categories. We start with undissolved inorganic material, which is the sand or silt, sometimes bits of plastic if it's a recycling system. Then there's undissolved organic matter, plant debris, soil or media particles, algae, microbes. And then there's the dissolved inorganics, salts, iron, manganese, calcium carbonates. These are usually tougher to take out and the dissolved organics, humic acids, pesticides, herbicides, PGRs, and the like. The pH and other characteristics of the water will affect if and how some of these will precipitate out of the water and what level of filtration will be required to capture them. So it's very important to start with water chemistry and know what is in your water that's clogging your tubes and your emitters. Once we understand what we're filtering out, we need to know how big it is. Let's take a minute to address the varying ways we reference filtration, particularly in the US. The common method of expressing filtration cap capability in the US is mesh size, but mesh size doesn't really directly relate to particle size, just the size of the holes in the filter material. 
and it doesn't address finer filtration targets that we're beginning to deal with in the industry. Mesh simply refers to the number of openings of one inch in, a, in an inch of screen. So a four mesh means there are four little squares across the linear inch of screen. A hundred mesh has a hundred openings in one inch of screen. The chart that I'm showing relates uh, various mesh sizes to actual particle size measured in microns and inches. And some things we relate to in that size range. Mesh is adequate only if we're concerned about filtering out the big stuff. But it really doesn't cut it when we get into finer filtration. In the illustration here, you can see that the higher mesh numbers above 800 mesh are parenthesized because they don't really exist. Take note, though, that there is a lot of serious filtration happening beyond the 800 mesh range. And that's the filtration levels that we're getting into in our industry now. Uh, here's a little bit more visual reference to particle size. Um, a micron, for those precision folks among us, is one millionth of one meter or one twenty-five thousand four hundredth of an inch. Waterborne pathogens range from as large as 100 microns for a protozoa to as small as 0 0.02 microns for some viruses. So a lot of the material that's plugging and uh, plugging our emitters and irrigation lines and causing uh, biofilm or adding to our biofilm is below the 10 micron range where virtually no one in the industry is filtering at this point. This next slide is really short shrifted in time for the amount of time that it deserves. But no consideration of filtration is complete without recognizing the effects of biofilm. Biofilm is increasingly being recognized as enemy number one of irrigation, filtration, and treatment systems in horticulture. Not a week goes by that I don't hear at least one story about unknown plugging and clogging that can be directly connected to biofilm issues. Here we see a quick illustration of the three final stages of biofilm development in a pipe and the end result of that biofilm being caught in the pressure compensating labyrinth of a drip emitter on the right hand side. It's important to realize that biofilm exists anywhere surfaces are in contact with water. And I might add, it exists within a matter of seconds of introducing water into a perfectly brand new pipe that's perfectly clean. And with the miles and miles of small diameter, high surface area pipes filled with fertilizer laden water, installed in warm, high light greenhouses, and just to add insult to injury, operated only intermittently, our industry really is biofilm nirvana, more than almost any other industry you can imagine. Simply put, in most operations, it is the primary cause of clogging of irrigation emitters. Designing a water filtration system without fully addressing the issue of biofilm is only a partial solution at best, and the piper will eventually have to be, be paid. That means considering not only the level of filtration required, but where it's located in the system, and what type of water treatment method is being used, and how that will affect the biofilm. In other words, will the biofilm not be affected at all? Or will it come out in large chunks? Will it come out in microscopic pieces? Or will it be burned up completely and pass easily through the emitters? It's important to address that question with any water treatment before you select the filtration system. Or you just result, it results in more frustration as your emitters clog while you're trying to solve the biofilm problem. As we've gained experience in filtration technology and results, an evolution of sorts is beginning in what growers are defining as adequate filtration. Again, we've tended to view filtration from an equipment-centric perspective. It's a component issue. Figure out what size the particles will, uh, that are gonna clog the emitter, pick a filter that will filter it out, we're done. 
As a result, we've typically seen pretty liberal filtration objective in terms of particles of particle size. Component-centric targets, things that are aimed at, at just keeping the emitters from being clogged, look something like this. If we look at flood systems, we've typically looked at 50 to 100 mesh, uh, 150 to 300 microns excluded. Sprinkler systems, step it up a little bit, 100 to 150 mesh, which is 150 down to maybe 100 microns in size. Drip systems, anything greater than 150 mesh, which is less than 100 microns. And mist systems, greater than 300 mesh, uh, less than 50 microns. Those are what I think are component-centric targets. Unofficially, these are more plant-centric targets that appear to be rising as a more conservative new level of filtration by some of the leading growers. I want to take an aside to say this is not established by research. This is simply experience in the field with what some growers are doing and the success levels that they are seeing. This really is based more on what's best for optimum plant health. The beauty of it is if we take care of the plants, all of the component requirements are satisfied too. So for example, in flood irrigation systems, we want to be at least at 300 mesh, and we look at five to no more than 50 microns. There are systems out there operating now that are filtering in flood systems down to five microns. Sprinklers, we want to go to at least 400 mesh, or five to no more than 35 microns. Drip systems to 500 mesh and uh, 15 microns or less to make sure that we get that, and I would actually step that up based on recent experience and say that 10 micron or less results in substantially less clogging of emitters. And for mist systems, 800 mesh or better, or five microns or less. Uh, and if you really want to go to optimum plant health, stick with 1,250 mesh as final level of filtration, five to 10 microns. That's tough, but it will result in better plant health and there won't be clogging issues or at least the clogging issues will be dramatically reduced. <clears throat>